Welcome to the Coop Tank. I'm your host, Steve Cooper, coming to you from Sweet Recording in beautiful Mount Laurel, New Jersey. You know, people, if you have a podcast, a video cast, an audio book, or even if you need a studio built, Sweet Recording is a place for you. Joe Ganjemi not only knows what he's doing, but he's a great guy and he's honest. So reach out to him. Check out their website, Sweet Recording, S U I T E Recording.com, or email them at hello at Sweet Recording.com. Anyway, we have a great show, and it's very funny. When I was doing my research, I found out that everyone except me has a uh, secondary education. I graduated with a Bachelor of Science. They all went to school after, so they're all advanced, so I'm the stupid one in the room. But uh, we have some great topics to cover today, and our guests are uh, from Jersey Man Magazine and Jersey Man Publishing and Jersey Man Events, Ashley Dunnick. How are you doing, Ashley? Hi, thanks. And from Vanguard Building Solutions, a guy I've known since high school who still has the same hair while mine is all left, we have Greg Santor. Steve, how you doing, buddy? And from Archer and Griner, we have Trevor Cooney, who's a Red Sox fan. Thanks, Coop. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so I want to get to know, so people hear what you do. Ashley, give a rundown of what Jersey Man, Miami Man, what you all do and what makes you different than the competition. Yeah, definitely. So we're a, a regional magazine, Jersey Man, Philly Man, and Miami Man. So we're always looking for regional content for our quarterly magazine, interesting stories that are happening in the area. But I think one of the most special parts of our business is our private networking group, the Legacy Club, which we host our events in all those three different cities, along with Boston, but I don't run that one. Um, and it's just a private networking group geared towards decision makers, but in a social capacity. So we have fun, we build relationships, um, and we do business together. So, you know, I love what I do. I work with my family and my father and, um, you know, happy to be here. And it's a great magazine. They did a feature on me. I was very, I was very happy about that. I, I put it on my wall and actually my mother-in-law went likes me now she thinks i have credibility and uh next we have mr greg santor tell us about you greg so steve for the last two years i uh i made a big career change into the energy business so uh for, through some friends uh got to vanguard building solutions we are an energy services company and uh, as you know through everything with sustainability and going green there's a big push by the government by the state and just by and, and individuals to to upgrade their energy infrastructure so what vanguard does we look at any type of building any type of business all commercial and we go in and we take a look at the building envelope the lighting the windows the hvac systems the whether or not they'd be a good candidate for solar um and we come up with a plan i have five engineers that go in and take a look at these buildings and then we go back to the client with a plan on how we're going to upgrade their energy infrastructure. But what really makes us different is we also find the rebates for them. So it could come from the utilities. It could come from the federal government. It could come from state government. There is a lot of money out there for businesses to upgrade their buildings at very little cost. We just had a million dollar project where the woman got 90% of it paid for by rebates and utilities. So for us, we're working with businesses uh, a lot in New Jersey. New Jersey, believe it or not, is the number one uh, state in the country for rebates and pushing this. New York is right behind them. So we do business all over the country, but right now, New Jersey and New York are really uh, our focus. Very cool. And how about you, Trevor? First of all, I was told there was going to be hair and makeup coupe, but you're going to be stuck with this today. All right. Uh, yeah, so I have, uh, like I said, I'm an attorney at Archer and Griner. I sort of wear two hats for the firm. I'm a partner in our business litigation group. So I handle a wide variety of, of business disputes between companies, against companies, for companies. But I'm also the head of our insurance coverage practice group. So we represent uh, commercial policyholders and only policyholders in disputes with insurance companies. So if you are sued, if you have a loss and the insurance company denies your claim or tries to limit the claim in some way, we try to maximize your recovery. We're your advocates working with your brokers to make sure the insurance company is held responsible into its requirements under the policy. So it's a big part of our practice. Okay. And I'm also a member of Jersey Man, so big, big push for Jersey Man. There you go. Okay, so I wanna ask, I, I, I didn't mention, you all have advanced degrees, okay? And you all have different, completely different jobs in all of what you do. What, when you went into college for your undergrad, your freshman year, when you went in, 
what was your plan? Like me, I was like, I go into business because I went to college, but I ended up falling into the world of comedy. It was a long story, but that my biz plan was to go into business. And I think I didn't really know much really what I wanted to do, but what, Ashley, what was your goal? Cause you have a master's in education, I believe. And uh, what, I mean, when you went in freshman year, what were you saying? You're like, I'm going to do this or, or you were not sure. I was not prepared for this question. Out of all the questions I thought you were going to ask, this was not it. Um, so I went in my undergrad, I have a, a bachelor's in uh, psychology. So I got a full scholarship to play basketball at a small division two school in Northeast Philly. And I made, you know, a series of immature decisions with my uh, academic career and picked a degree that I could almost do absolutely nothing with. So when I was done, I had no choice but to figure out, you know, what can I do next to strengthen that degree? And I wanted to coach. I loved basketball and teaching kind of fell in line with that. So I got my master's in education and and was in, um, you know, teaching for about three years before you know, my dad asked me to join his team and uh, that's kind of how I ended up there. So I, I barely used either one. I didn't use my psychology degree one bit and I barely used my master's degree and I'm doing a completely, you know, different thing than I originally sought out to do. So that's good. I think a lot of people do that. Well, Trevor, you probably was, was your path to be a lawyer? Did you know from like when you were going in? Cause I heard you were a really good athlete in college, right? I was an athlete. I don't know if I was really good, but I, I played football and baseball for two years, Division three school. Uh, but yeah, no, I came out, I uh, think I was a biology major. I graduated with a biology degree thinking I was going to be pre-med and organic chemistry, the weeder class of all weeder classes, uh, told me I wasn't going to be a doctor anymore and uh, had to make a, a decision my senior year, really. I didn't want to, I wasn't ready to enter the workforce yet. I knew I wanted to get some advanced degree and uh, uh, looked at law school thinking I could use my biology degree to do intellectual property law, become a patent attorney, for example. And, uh, uh, but yeah, no, I had no grand plans. I think I was a good student in high school and did well in science and thought that would be the natural, natural progression to become a doctor of some sort. But once I decided no medical school, I didn't want to do research or be stuck in a lab somewhere doing that kind of work. So decided uh, to try law school with no lawyers in my family. I've my parents were both teachers, so no, no, uh, no background in the law to guide me. So I kind of ended up in a good place, but all kind of purely by accident. How about you, Greg? And I, Greg, you have a long story, so we can't go into it. I mean, you, Greg, if you guys, if you ever can do a one-on-one -on -one with Greg, talk to him. He's got some fast. He's like he was like best friends with Robin Leach. I mean, and I'm not bullshitting. That's the God's honest truth. But Greg, what leaving Cherry Hill East, going to Rutgers? which like almost everyone did, but I went to Stockton. What was, what was your goal? What did you want to do? Well, you know, it's, it's funny. Uh, I was a year ahead of you and I was the class clown when I graduated high school, but you went into comedy. So we have to figure out how that, how that all works. But, you know, I'm first gen, right? I was the first one in my family to go to college. So I didn't, I knew I had to go. I knew I wanted to go. You know, I was, I worked all through high school and I learned a lot about business, but I really wanted to kind of, hone those skills up. So when I went in, I didn't necessarily know exactly what I wanted to do. I did think I was headed to law school. That was probably my plan almost through uh, the end of going to Rutgers, but I got out of the gate early. I got lucky. I got a, a medical sales job while I was in college and then got right out and went into medical sales. Um, but I had, and I tell everybody this, the key to my career was good mentors. And I still have them. And one of the people I worked for when I was in the medical equipment business said, I need you to go start getting your master's. And he goes, you know, you've already accomplished a good amount, but you're going to go up for a big job someday and everything else being equal, if somebody has their master's and you don't, um, you're going to regret it. So I went back to Rutgers for my, for my MBA when I was 29. And, uh, started it took me four and a half years when I started I had no kids when I was done I had two kids and I was running a company and so um I never thought that would all happen but I got some good direction from folks along the way now you're all of you are successful okay and it's, it's a given you wouldn't be on the show if you weren't I don't like any you know I like people who have stuff going on and they have good personalities and what do you think I want to ask you when you aren't in a room like networking or whatever when you're not in a room what do you hope 
What do you hope that people are saying about you? We'll start with you, Trevor. When you're not in a room, when you leave and someone goes, hey, that's Trevor Cooney, you know, uh, what do you what do you want them to say about you or or you would like them to say about you? I think more than anything that, that I'm authentic. Like I, I don't hide who I am. I try to be open and honest with everyone. And and I think that authenticity goes a long way in developing relationships. So um, you'll you'll get all of me when you see me, when you meet me. Um, um, like I said, I'm straightforward to you. I tell, tell you like it is. I think I'm a pretty affable guy. I can get along with just about anyone. So I can fake it if I need to. But I do want people to, to think I'm an authentic, true person and uh, someone who is easy to get along with. And, and, and frankly, I do like meeting people. I new and interesting and different people. So someone who's willing to uh, help out. And, and you know, we, we go to these networking groups for business, obviously, and we try to do this for a business purpose. But I do try to be just the helper in the room as well. So it's, yeah, hopefully my authenticity shines through. How about you, Greg? Well, yeah, I like to think of myself as, as a resource, somebody that people will go, oh, you know what, if I need something, I'm going to call Greg. And that's kind of how I've been my whole career. And that's why I've been in many different industries and uh, still have relationships across the board. Um, I just had this, and this is a good example. My first boss from when I graduated college, which is, you know, 41 years ago, called me last week. He calls me every single year for the last 41 years on my birthday. It's an amazing thing when you have somebody that, that does that. But now Michael is 78 and he's calling me for business advice. And, you know, he taught me, he got me groomed. But for me, I want people to think of me as a resource when I'm not around. Like, who do we know that can get that done? Or who do we know that can help us? And, you know, when they think of me in that capacity, I feel like I can help people. All right. How about you, Ash? Yeah, similar to Greg, I think like a connector, like people, I want people to be like, Ashley will know who you want to talk to. Ashley will put you in front of that person. And, and not just based on what people do for a living, but who they are and who they would genuinely form a connection with. And so I think that's probably what people say, you know, along with, I'm very, being very competitive. <laughs> I, I love to win. Doesn't really matter what it is. Like, I just want to win. Uh, uh, so I think that's probably falls out of people's mouths as well. I'm okay with that because I do. I like it. Hey, here's something because we're, you know, social media is big. You know, LinkedIn, as for instance, you know, LinkedIn. Uh, I want to know, and I always bring this up, what, what term on LinkedIn just bothers you? Like, I hate, I hate self-proclaimed experts. It's like everybody is a goddamn expert. And it's like, I want to be an expert on saying you're not a self-proclaimed expert. Because anyone, you know, I, I can tell from you, we always learn. You know, I'm learning from this podcast. I've done over a th almost a thousand episodes of my other podcast. But every time I get behind the mic, I learn. And I learn something new and I take it and absorb it. So I hate the term expert. But what's a term that you really hate? And we'll start with you, Ashley, because, you oh, know, you're gosh. competitive. I, I don't even... To be honest, like in social media, LinkedIn, I don't even use LinkedIn. I know that's probably terrible to say, but it gives me cringe. It, cringe, it makes me cringe. Um, it's I'm always getting like the messages from people who are trying to, you know, they're just sending out these mass emails and it's, it's you know, landing in my inbox and people that maybe came to one event and they're adding me. So I, I certainly don't use LinkedIn the right way. Um, I don't even, I really don't even know how to answer that question because of that. Um, you know, social media is not something that I utilize and I probably should be better at that. But um, yeah, I wish I had a better answer. Yeah, but you don't really have to utilize it because you guys, you guys have such a strong following anyway that it doesn't, it just, people post about like when there's an event for Jersey men, people post about it. So you don't, you don't need to have that presence because it's exactly. just something and you know what you have. How about you, uh, Trevor? What, what terms do you hate? You know, there's always that word of the day or, or a term that catches on and then everyone uses it. I think for the last few, maybe five or 10 year, years now, it's synergy. Everything has a synergy with something else. Um, I should probably read my own LinkedIn bio before I say this. God forbid it's it's in my own bio. But yeah, that one always makes me laugh. Uh, I, I don't think it was used prior to 2000 very often. But as the, the world of social media, people have to come up with new terms to put on their pages and 
on the business context, yeah, we have synergy with everyone apparently. Which if you have synergy with everyone, you have synergy with no one. But but it's it's always on there. How about you, Greg? Well, I, I could tell you the word, the career, the uh, adjective of influencer drives me crazy. Um, because you know, I, I worked in recruiting. I worked in that. I don't still understand how that's a job. Um, I get what it means, but I think, you know, as you go through your career, you gain credibility and networking skills and resourceful, but to just declare yourself an influencer when <laughs> it, it's not, it, it's not a job. Uh, it, that that word probably bothers me and you'll see a lot of young people now put that in their in, on linkedin in their in their title space right ceo influencer this that and you're like all right you're 22 isn't that right yeah so let, isn't that let's, right, Greg? let's figure out how you're going to get <laughs> get to the long term so uh i joke about it but it's i that's one of the things uh, if you had to ask my pet peeve that would be it well, you know, it's funny you say about influencers. I also say, you know, I, I wanted to post this on LinkedIn, but I'm going to piss people off. I said, an influencer, a business coach, and a uh, and a consultant walk into the room, they walk into a bar, and they tell the guy for how much, how they can change it and make it better for four hundred dollars an hour. So that was that was just my philosophy. But someone said people might get pissed at me because some people have thin skin. So, but Greg, Greg hit it though. Influencer, right? You, you can't declare yourself an influencer. Someone else may be able to call you one, but you shouldn't be able to declare it yourself. Exactly. Well, that's like that's like declaring yourself an expert. It's like giving yourself a nickname. People have called me Coop my whole life because my last name is Coop. I never sat there and said, "Hey, everyone, call me Coop." So that's what happens. So we're all working. We're working hard. You have a bad day. We all have bad days. How do you snap out of it? Like when you sit there, like some people dwell, but when you have a bad day, a bad business day, or just something doesn't go right at the office, how do you rebound when you come in the next day or when you get home at night? How do you how do you take that edge off so you can sit there and go, it's going to be okay? And we'll start with you, Trev. You know, I'm it's not a I'm not very good at that. I'll be honest with you. It sometimes languishes with with me. Um, I'm a golfer by nature, and the golf is sort of my relief in a lot of way, or my release. So I. Well, oftentimes try to just go play around the golf, not think about work at all, not think about life, just sort of focus on that, chasing that little white ball around and then re-engage and try to clear my air and, and, you know, positive thinking and all those types of things that go with it. But I'm not, it, it lingers for me. I will tell you, it's not a strength of mine and it, it does um, follow me around for, for a little while. So I do try to do something that's just completely get away from work is, if I can and uh, hit the hit the hit the course and walk around try walk if i can just clear my head that way how about you greg well I, i'm a gym guy so for me you know that's where i can go and escape very quickly from from my daily routine i go in the mornings early i'm like 5 30 in the morning every day but if i have a bad day at work and i'm in an outlet i, I will go back to the gym get on a bike just do something to kind of have an outlet. And, uh, you know, I'm lucky. I'm, I'm, my wife and I have been together 44 years. So she she's a good uh, sounding board. Um, she'll just say, snap out of it or, you know, let's go do something or let's go distract you from it. But, you know, that's a skill that you acquire as you get older because I was horrible at separating work and anything else for most of my career. I'm just starting to learn that, you know, you can't take everything home with you. How about you, Ashley? Because you, well, you, you're always like, because you, you're active if you're in an event. I mean, you, there's days you're probably pulling long days or you're going to Miami, which no one's, you can't complain about flying to Miami. But uh, how do you, how do you get away from the bad day? Because you're also, you're the face of the company somewhat. Your dad is, but you're also, so it's, you, they, people perceive you that, you know, you shouldn't have a shitty day. I'm sure people go like, whoa, what's wrong with Ashley? She's in a crappy mood. And it's like, well, sorry, you know, I almost got hit by a car on the way over to this event. But what, how do you get out of it? Yeah, I mean, I definitely, working out definitely helps me, you know, just getting a sweat in after and getting my, clear in my mind always helps. And I love a project. So something probably not a lot of people like know about me is I'm like always DIYing something. I'm going to redo my deck. I'm going to rip down my fence and put up a new fence. I'm, I'm always working on something in my house and it just distracts my mind because I have a very hard time 
like disconnecting from work. I'm, I'm always on and I'm on late sometimes. And I'm, so just to be able to distract my mind by like, you know, picking up my tools, going out in my garden, something like that just kind of really helps me, you know, decompress and forget about everything else. So we all have good jobs. We all like what we do. And, you know, once again, back to LinkedIn, you see people who go, I love my job. Hashtag, I love my job. I always see it with comics. They're doing an open mic. I love my job. I'm like, it's not your job because you're not getting paid. You're doing an open mic. Okay. Your job is whatever you do. There's nothing wrong with that, but stop with the damn hashtag. I love my job. But saying that, what do you love about your job? Greg, what do you, what do you love about what you do? Well, for me, I love, I'm in a new, totally new industry, right? I've been in a lot of different industries, but I, I miss managing and running a company. So to me, I love helping other people be successful because that's kind of what helped me get here. I've had mentors my whole career. And now, you know, we're building this company very quickly. I have 25 employees and I'm getting to mentor some younger people who I know are going to be superstars. So, so for me, the industry is interesting. Energy is interesting right now. Um, you see it in the headlines every day, and uh, it's certainly something we should all be paying attention to. But I think the best part for me is just managing and helping the people and my employees. How about you, Ashley? What do you, what do you love about Jersey Men? I mean, I get to come up with ideas for events and execute them and bring people together. And I think I have like the best job because that's part of what I do every single day. It's exciting. It's fun. I get, I'm very social. I get to be around people, but by far my favorite thing is working with my dad. And that, that sounds crazy to a lot of people. And I do hear horror stories from like family businesses and things like that. But I feel like really like blessed and like grateful to be working with my dad, being able to spend so much time with him, learn from him and like build this company together. So you know, I thought I've loved jobs in the past, but this is a totally different, you know, feeling for me, like the passion that comes with like a family business. And I just feel really, really blessed. So that's that. I want to follow up though. Is it, I just want to follow up with you real quick, Ashley. Um, is it, is it harder to work with your dad? Cause your dad's such a, a, a big guy. He's very intimidating and he Ken's a wonderful guy. And, you know, mm -hmm. you know, he played for the Eagles, you know, he's got a big following. Is it hard sometimes to work with your dad because you really want to make him happy, even though I'm sure he's happy that you're working with him. I mean, how, is there a, for you, you love your job, you love what you do, but is there an added pressure because your dad is a very big figure? Um, you know, I, I really have never felt that. I, I've never felt an added pressure. I think we're, we're very different, even though we have certain similarities and we really balance each other out really well. And I feel like, you know, it's, it's almost like an asset. Like when I, you know, we just, we, we, we just fill each other's voids of like, you know, he's this type of way and I'm a very different type of way. And he doesn't ever make me feel like I need to reach a certain bar. He's always, you know, he's always proud of me. And as a daughter, like that means so much to me. And it makes me want to work harder just because like, you always want your dad to be proud of you and you want to you know, run your, your business that's in your family's name and do it justice. So yeah, no, I, I don't really, I've never really felt like that with my dad. That's good. What do you love about your job, Trevor? You're a lawyer. What do you love about being a lawyer? The synergy that, no, I can't say that. Um, <laughs> you know, more than a couple of things, really. It's, it's one is it is a challenge. I do get to work through and, and strategize with others and work through problems in a unique way. I do like that part of it. But as a litigator, I think it's the variety of it. I get to deal with different cases on, a, obviously the core issues can be the same, but different, uh, different cases on different issues. And I get to learn, when I have a client, I try to learn their business as well as I can. So I get to learn a lot about different businesses, how they run their business, the strengths and weaknesses of them, just being able to partner with, with the clients to, to help them along the way. But it's, it's really that variety, no, no day is, is the same. No, no case is the same, even so, even though some of the core issues are. I want to follow up with what do you not like about your job? Trevor, we'll start with you. What do you not like about being a lawyer? I mean, there's got to be something you don't like about it. Yeah, I, I, would, I would tell you that most lawyers would tell you or most private practice lawyers <clears throat> would tell you that the almighty bill of all hour, having to record every six minutes of your time, 
uh, on a daily basis because that's how we you know that's how we make our our living is is billing billing hours but to have to track your time on a daily basis in six minute increments is the bane of every lawyer's existence so the the ones that go to um become an in-house attorney somewhere or work for a company in that capacity they will always say that oh to not have to develop business anymore not have to network not have to keep track of my time just be just be a lawyer and focus on that practice how about you ashley because you love your job and as you say but there's got to be something you don't like about your job i mean everybody has off days and i i really can have off days when i'm when i'm at an event i'm like the person that's you know meeting and greeting with everybody like i feel like sometimes you know, you're, you're just in a bad mood and, and you might be a little cranky that day and you still have to talk to 150 people and, and be like the friendly, welcoming face. And sometimes that's really challenging, especially when you're, maybe you've done it like five days in a row that week and you're like, I've had enough. I, I'd like to just not talk to anybody for 24 hours if that's possible. And it's usually not possible for me, so. How about you, Greg? What do you not, because you're newer though, but what do you not like about your job? Well, you know, I don't know if it's what I don't like about the job other, more than it's what I just don't like about what's going on in business in general these days, right? COVID, there's still a lot of people using coming out of COVID and trying to reinvent themselves and trying to make decisions and trying to find out where their money's coming from. So for us, a lot of those factors factor into people making decisions. So I see longer we put a lot of work into what we have to do to go out and assess a building and put engineering drawings together and all that. And then sometimes our sales cycle will be six months to nine months to a yes. So for me, it's the waiting. I, I like to get things done and I like, but you can't force your clients to work in your timeline a lot of times. So for me, it's still the, the people trying to reinvent themselves a, after this business. And I think, you know, across the board, I, I, I've, been trying to do it internally and I try to help our clients if I can, but that's probably the most frustrating thing to me. Okay, yeah, business is changing a lot. Now, we're all at different stages of our careers. We're all different stages of our lives, you know, and I wanna know, what do you define to yourself? What defines success to you? What is, I mean, we all change when we're younger, it's different. As I always say, you know, I wanted to be a, a big star when I was younger. Thank God I'm, I wasn't because I don't know where I'd be now. I'd probably be on my fifth wife. I'd probably be dead. I'd be on TMZ or something crazy. But I always, I always wonder what, what defines success? Greg, what defines for you? What, how do you define success? Well, I, I had, you know, I think at different points of your career, you define it differently. I'm at the point in my life, I'm 60 years old, my, I, my kids are both doing well, right? I, you know, wanted to set good examples for my kids, set good work ethics, make sure they got, uh, both got good educations. They were both college athletes. So, you know, the, 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 you know, to me now, I look back and go, what, what else is there? Um, you know, my kids are doing well, I'm not going to miss a meal, um, and they're getting started in their lives and their careers. So for me, that's really what my measurement of success is now. You know, along the path, I was always, you know, you know, always chasing the, you know, the gold and trying to be famous and trying to be a leader. Um, but I, I feel like success now is really about my kids are in a good spot and I consider myself, you know, somebody that can help other people throughout their lives and careers. So to me, that's, that's the measurement. Right. Greg's a little humble. He says, my kids were uh, college athletes. Uh, his daughter was like the best field hockey player ever to come out of South Jersey. And he won't say that, but she was like, you know, she was, she wasn't she like athlete of the year or in New Jersey or something. Yeah. I mean, she, she, she did pretty well coming out of Eastern and, and she played at Rutgers. Um, and my son played at LaSalle and uh, listen, it's life lessons, right? The, both of them, had a lot of adversity and you guys were college athletes, you know, and I had a blown ACL that limited my career and a lot of things, but um, everything to me is a life lesson. And, you know, if everybody can take away from the bad experiences they have and, and keep going, that's really what your the whole life is about getting to the next level. How about you, Ashley, what's success to you? Because you've, your career has been different now, you know, and you're, your business is growing. I mean, your business has grown very fast. And now with Miami man, boss, man, what, what for you, what defines success to you at this point in your life? 
being happy with what I do every day and what I'm waking up and doing every single day because you know there's jobs or opportunities I've had in the past where I I made a lot more money and and I wasn't happy and it, you don't even think about that in the moment you know like in hindsight it's kind of crazy because you could be making all this money if you're miserable it really doesn't matter like I'm happy I love my life and I feel like that is my success you know it, it kind of turns into my business and molds into my business just by, you know, having that feeling every day. I, you know, I, I wouldn't change that for all the money in the world. How about you, Trevor? Well, besides, you know, being a Patriots fan and all the Super Bowls, what, 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 uh, what is uh, success to you? Yeah, those days are apparently gone, but <laughs> I think Greg and Ashley hit it on the head, right? It's being to say you're content in your, in this point in your life, right? Content both professionally and personally. And that's not, being necessarily satisfied that you're not going to still strive to be better, but it's all right. I'm in, I've reached a point where I'm, um, I'm comfortable that I'm going to be able to provide for my family. I'm going to be able to be a good role model to my kids. Uh, hopefully Libby looked up to me and I'm well-respected in my personal and professional lives. It's, it's, it, you're right. It is, it isn't all about money, but you want to be in a position where you're able to do the things you want to do when you want to do them. And, um, you know, I'm not one to sort of live beyond my means or be extravagant by any, in any sense of the word, but um, I want to be able to take my family on vacation when I want to do it. I want to be uh, work on the types of cases that I want to work on, just being able to sort of make those decisions on my own uh, to, in, in getting me to a point where I'm content um, in both aspects of my life. Now, we're in a, a day and age where networking is very important. It used to be back in the 80s cold calling was important. That's how you got, that's how you got to people because there was no internet. You couldn't just sit there and send someone a, uh, a email and go, Hey, let's meet up for coffee or this. There was no zoom. You could do that. And you had to actually get out, get up off your ass. And, you know, and there wasn't as many networking events. It seems, I don't know, maybe because I was in comedy, I was always out of town, but what do you love about networking on one side? And this is a two part question. And we're going to start with Ashley in this because she's the queen of networking. What do you love about networking? And what do you hate about networking? For me, I'll say real quick, I love helping people out. I guess I'm called a go giver. I've heard that term. I don't, you know, I, I like to help people out. That's how I was brought up. I don't like phonies. I don't like people who are full of crap, people who are faking it until they make it because that just makes me sick because being someone who did comedy, we observe, and I can see right through the bullshit of somebody. And so for you, what are your two coins? What do you love about networking, Ashley? And what don't you like? Yeah, I mean, when people tell me like they cold call for a living or how they have to find like leads and prospects, I mean, networking for me is, is the only way to go to, to meet potential clients and build relationships. So like, that's what I love. I'll never do a cold call that, that, that feeling of having to call an unsolicited phone call. Nobody, nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to receive that call and blind emails or the LinkedIn things. I mean, it, it might be a fit for certain people. That's not how I want to meet people. I want to go to a networking event, have a great conversation with somebody, make a friendship and see how we can help one another. Um, and then on the other side, what I don't like is not being able to turn off kind of my same answer as last time you know it's like you, you need to con you need to network in order to continue to build your business and for me that's what I do every single day of the week and some days I'm just not feeling it or I'm kind of just my you know my social meter is is off the off the charts and I'm just kind of drained and I don't really have the luxury of being able to turn off some days so how about you, Trevor? Because you're out and about. What do you, what do you like about networking, and what do you not like about networking? Well, I'm a pretty social person, so I do like the just the interactions with new and different people, and learning about how different people work professionally, how they su succeed in life. But it's funny. There's I, I do see in in going to to all these events. <clears throat> excuse me. There's a difference between people who do business development as their job, right? Their job is to do BD for a company. Versus people who, and I and I'm gonna sound like a whiner doing this, but like I I work as the attorney during the day, but you still have to be your own business development development professional as well. So it's wearing two hats. It's it's being a lawyer and then doing my business development on top of it. So part of it can be it just lead to long days, right? Or long days and long nights when you're when I'm, I can't just do my business development necessarily during the day when I'm supposed to be doing my work. So it's that 
it's that secondary piece of it. I have to I have to be built. And I don't know that a lot of people coming out of law school understand the business development part of it. They just think I can be a good lawyer and I'll be successful in life, but it doesn't necessarily work like that. So we we actually encourage our younger associates or our junior associates to hit the pavement right away, join these groups, become involved. You may not develop work right away because you don't have an established practice yet, but get out there as soon as you can so that you're developing those relationships that will ultimately become a business uh, opportunity for you. But yeah, it's that, it's sort of, I got to work and then I got to do my work again in the, in the evening. That's the part I don't like. How about you, Greg? Um, the, the, the part I like about networking is just meeting new people. I mean, you know, you can build a career on this. Um, I worked in sports for 15 years prior to getting into this business and the whole sports world is built on networking. I went to every NCAA uh, championship, every Super Bowl, every, I mean, it was awesome, but it's a lot of work. And um, so this is the first job I've had in many years that wasn't specialized, where no matter what, as long as I'm talking to somebody who owns a building or runs a building, they're a potential customer. I've been in very specific areas of either healthcare or sports or technology. And this one, you could do deal with everybody. So that's the great part. The bad part is you can deal with everybody. And kind of to Trevor's point is that it's very time consuming. You know, and I'm I'm running the company and trying to develop business for the company and everything else. So it's a lot of work, a lot of time, and a lot of, you know, you, you got to figure out who's who really wants to build a relationship and who just wants to kind of piggyback on what you're doing. So, you know, I, I love it. You, you can't not do it. And that's how we've all built businesses from day one. So I, I can't say there's anything I hate about it. It's just very time consuming. I, I asked this question last week and it fascinated me because, um, I don't, I don't read business books. Okay. I don't, I don't, it's just, I don't really like to read much. I'll, I'll listen to, you know, if I'm interview, I interviewed the drumming from the talking head. So I, I listened to his autobiography just to get a little background. And I just, I, business books don't interest me. And I know people will like, Oh yeah, this book changed my life. You know, the only person that has ever changed my life is my cardiologist and my wife, you know, no book is changing my life, but is there any books that you have read recently or a book, a business book, or it can be a book about an athlete. Is there any book that you have read in the last few years that has made a difference? Trevor, is there any book that you've read? I mean, are you, are you a guy who reads a lot of business books? Cause I can't even, I can know like, I know Tony Robbins has books and, and that, but is there any, are you one of these guys who reads the book and goes, Holy shit, this is life changing tomorrow. I'm going to go, I'm going to knock on 8,000 doors. Yeah. It, is there just, any, are, are you one of those book guys? No, it's just not how I work. That stuff doesn't motivate me that the hoorah stuff, I, I get it. It works for some people, but I am not, I read so much for my job during, during the work day that I really don't spend a lot of time um, reading business related books and motivational type of books afterwards. I listen to a lot of podcasts more to, like I said, to get away from work, to clear my head, a lot of comedy type podcasts, a lot of sports podcasts, but I'm not, not that I'm not a reader. It's, I just read so much during the day. I, I don't a lot read for pleasure. I, I sort of listen the podcast and get my inf information through podcasts and other, and other outlets like that. How about you, Ashley? Are you, are you one of these business book readers? I, for some reason, I don't think you are. I, I, I just, I know your personality. I think you're probably like, uh, I deal with, but yeah. What, tell me, do you read any of these business books? No, I have, I don't read uh, books at all for pleasure. I'm not going to lie. The last book I read, which did impact me tremendously. And it was a member, Steve Goodman gave me this book. He knew I was, new to this industry. I had come from a teaching background. I was kind of jumping into a new world where what does networking really mean? And he gave me the go-giver. And, 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 I'm, and I'm not going to lie, like that book had a tremendous impact on me. And it just taught me, you know, it, it simplified networking. It, it's really, it's not as complicated as, you know, people make it out to be. It's like, you know, do good for other people. And, and it comes back to you. And and that's the last book I've read for pleasure, probably. Ashley, was that Steve Goodman from Morgan Lewis? No, from the YMCA. Oh, okay. And the Village People. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, Greg, how about you? What's a book you've read? Well, I do read 
a lot. I'm, I'm a skimmer because I'm a recent, just by, I love research. I love learning, but I will tell you the last book that had an impact on me from a business standpoint was uh, good to great Jim Collins, because I really like the, the format of showing very specific turnarounds, you know, of a business who lost their way or a leader who lost their way and then somehow found their way back to uh, greatness. So for me, that's the one book that that I remember out of all the books that I read or have read that's had the biggest influence on me. Um, I do more reading on the internet and go find topics that I need. Um, like Trevor, for I read all day. We're doing research all day. We're doing proposals all day. So the last thing I want to go do is go home and start reading more of that. So I, I like a lot of escape type of stuff. I, I'm right on my, I'm just looking, it's funny, one of my desk here is, a, is a new, Anthony Horowitz, who's the new writer for the James Bond novels. So I've writ, written, read all the James Bond. I like the escapist type of stuff, the action adventure type, but you know, I do read the business books as well. Here's a question. If you weren't doing what you're doing now, what would be your what would be your dream job? What would you be wanting doing? I mean, if there was something, if someone said, Trevor, Ashley, Greg, here we go. This is what you could have done. You know, I mean, you could have been Greg, you could have been a rock star. I mean, what what would you have said? Ashley, if someone said, Ashley, here's a wish, here's where your life, what would you have wanted to do? I mean, I love, I love sports. I love basketball and, and maybe coaching um, would have been, you know, a dream job for me being a basketball coach. Um, but even like, as I've kind of been in this professional world and if something ever happened with Jersey man, I think I would get into real estate. I, I've always, I've always liked real estate and you get to talk to people, you get to find people their dream homes. Um, I think I would be really good at it. So those kind of two avenues would be the first things that come to mind. How about you, Greg? Well, I was able to get a very brief look at it, but I loved the entertainment industry um, and animation in particular. So, you know, as a hobby, I always did cartooning. I always could do the voices and, uh, you know, had a little, uh, when I had that business screen friends, I was able to get a little exposure to, to it. Um, it just wasn't the right time, you know, to, drop everything and, you know, get into that animation, but animated films and all that stuff. I still um, really love the, that whole filmmaking and the, the behind the scenes part of it. So, you know, I still think I have a shot at that sometime if I can, you know, just retire and stop running companies. But uh, that was probably what I would love to do. You can animate. I'm, I have a kid's book I'm writing. You can animate it for me if you want. We'll, there you we'll go. Talk, we'll talk. It's called the Christmas cricket. Kids books only have to be 27 pages. It's nothing. It's an easy stage. It's, Beginning, middle, end. Boom. It's not like a screenplay. How about you, Trevor? Maybe a professional cornhole player. I don't know. Ashley would tell you. I play a lot of cornhole uh, for fun. Um, you know, I, I similarly have a lot of passion for music and, and entertainment and sports. So a lot of, I think when I transitioned from pre-med to law, I considered going into being a sports agent. You know, I think that's something that's in interested me because I'm so passionate about sports and my sports teams, all my Boston sports teams that I've carried with me down here. So, yeah, I think that would be if I had pursued that, I, I think it could have been an exciting career, uh, one that you're um, it just it, it energizes you because you're already interested in the subject matter and you're living it and you're you're dealing with your, your heroes, if you will, in the sports world. So something that would keep you passionate, I think, throughout. I have one final question. I always close a show with this. If someone's getting out of trade school or college or high school and they're they're young and they're what's the term uh, bushy tailed and bright eyed and they're they're taking the world they they want to take the world by storm. And when you look back on your experiences, and I know what Greg's going to say, and it's going to be mentors. I want you to get more into that. But what would you? I mean, I'm guessing what was the advice that you would give someone if someone came up and said, "Hey, you know." Give me some advice. Help me understand what I'm going to go through when I'm jumping into the real world. What would you tell them, Greg? What would you tell them? Well, I, this generation has um, a little tougher time listening. Um, everybody wants to be a CEO by the time they're 23. 
I, I, uh, I like to use a term, I like to skip to the head of the line. You know, you can do a lot when you're young. And listen, I got a lot of opportunities when I was young too. I think what happens is you have somebody who looks at you, they see your potential, and they probably give you a shot at the next level before you're really ready. But they think you can grow into that job. And I, I was lucky when I was younger that somebody took that chance with me. But I, I was very good at listening to my mentors because these were very successful people. They were wealthy people. And they were people who you wanted to emulate. So you can have all that. But if you don't listen to what they're telling you, and it's just, all right, I'll, I'll engage them for a half hour, but I want to go do what I want to do anyway, it's hard to be successful. Because you have to surround yourself with successful people and learn from their mistakes. Let them teach you. If they've made the mistake already, there's no reason for you to make it. So I think listening uh, is a big deal. And I think it's hard for people in their 20s to understand what that means. I think it's even harder today. How about you, Ashley? I would say to be genuine and authentic, no matter what career you're doing, who you're talking to, because people are going to remember that if you change careers 20 times, but you're still a good person and people like you, that's what they're going to remember. And, you know, your 30 second commercial is not nearly as important as just being your authentic self and people liking you for who you are. So. That's a good answer. And how about you, Trevor? I think it's being willing to be uncomfortable, get out of your comfort zone. I have, so I just dropped off my oldest to, for he's got a first year at LSU. And uh, I said to him, you got it. You know, you have to be yourself, but you also need to uh, be willing to do things that are, looked at by some people as uncool or something you haven't done before. Sit in the front of the class, go speak to your professors after class, uh, engage in, in uh, he's, he's gonna be a business major, engage with the, the business societies that are out there, but be willing to get out of your comfort zone. I mean, you're, you know what you know, you know what you don't know necessarily, but, but um, just put yourself out there and don't be afraid to make a mistake be embarrassed a little bit uh, because that's how you learn and grow. So I think that's more than anything. What you should that do. was great. This is great today. I always love talking to people. You all have such different insights. Now, how can people get in touch with you? Ashley, how can they find out about you and Jersey man? And, and you want to get people to your events? How can they find you? Yeah. Check, um, check us out on our website, jerseymanmagazine.com. Um, my email is a Dunnick at jerseymanmagazine.com. How about you, Greg? So same thing, our website is vbs-energy.com and, and my email is greg at vbs-energy.com, but also people can, you know, hooked up with me on LinkedIn uh, as well. So uh, I, I check it pretty, pretty frequently, but more than happy. You, How about you, Trevor? Yeah, archerlaw.com, um, all over social media, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, you'll find all my handles there. So yeah, find out, reach out to these people. Go to a Jersey Man event. You'll have fun. Uh, go on to YouTube. Look up the Coop Tank. Uh, the, the Roundtable episodes are up there. Rate them, subscribe, say you liked it. Uh, go to the thecooptank.podbean.com or Spotify, Amazon Music, or iHeartRadio, and you can find past episodes where I interview people like Tony Luke Jr. and TJ Colizzi and different people, very thought leaders, for I change this stuff. Also, if you want to advertise, you know, the people who come on my show are – strong professional business people that everyone knows and my listeners are the same so and my viewers so if you want to advertise email me at the coop tank at yahoo.com and i'm going to give a shout out to my friend joe ganjami who produces this and every episode of the coop tank the only reason i have him here is because he's great at what he does and i i like i want quality so reach out to them at sweetrecording.com. i'm steve cooper thank you for listening and watching and i'll talk to you guys next time